So this is preaching for souls. And the passage before us now is about alternatives to God. I'm sure everyone knows that. Now, there's a, a, a certain concern that we should have about negativism in our preaching of the gospel because we have the task of so preaching that the Holy Spirit can use our words to bring people under conviction of sin, to enable them to feel and know their rebellion against God and the measure of human sinfulness. And yet it is possible to see that in all these passages of the Bible from which the gospel may be preached and to see little or nothing else so that the preaching becomes heavily negative. It's something that is a danger with evangelistic preaching. And we want to preach the grace side of it. Of course we do. But we're too ready to see the fall and the depravity and the sinfulness. Now, we cannot back away from that. That's vital. That's essential to so preach that people will feel their need and come to repentance. But there are many other aspects of evangelistic reasoning and persuasion. There are so many things that the soul away from God lacks. And we come to our people with sympathy. We come because, well, we've all been in this position which they are in, away from God, lost and under condemnation. And we come with sympathy and we want to win them and we want to show them what's missing from their lives. There's more to it than simply bringing out the matter of sin and offense, though that is vital. There is no other way to God but by faith and repentance. They are the twin elements, essential things, the doctrine of faith and the doctrine of repentance. And they must both be in an evangelistic sermon. Yet there are so many other things. And here's an example. So let me just sketch a few features of what may be preached from Exodus chapter 20 and verse 3. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The passage, as I mentioned, is about idolatry. It's about worship. And as I'm sure you often mention to people, we are worshipping creatures. We're made by God to worship him. And if we do not worship him, we worship alternative gods or material things or whatever, all kinds of things in our lives which attract our worship. So we're all naturally worshippers. But here, though it's cast in negative terms, is a most positive line of argument. I am the Lord thy God, verse 2, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So let's start back at verse 2. I am the Lord thy God. What a positive starting point, friends. I am the Lord, thy God. God is ready to be our God. Indeed, he is always our God, but he's ready to be approached by us. I am available, he seems to say. I am here. I am your true God. I have made you. You owe everything to me, and I am the God who you must approach, not some man-made God, not some substitute God, but these are words laden with promise and it's possible for us to bring this out. We have a God ready to be approached, ready to bless, ready to hear our cries, ready to deliver us, ready to forgive all our sin. We have a God who pities us from on high and has compassion toward us. We have such a God that should all come out. This is such a positive start. It's the Ten Commandments, and yet it's God affirming his being and his care and his concern and his rightful place as our God. And then in verse 3, thou shalt have no other gods before me, or as it literally says in the Hebrew, before my face. There is this man on brazen idolatry, 
We are not supposed to make any representation of the true God. Indeed, we cannot. Verse 4, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. And this is positive, really. Why is there a ban on any kind of representation of God or any image? Well, because... Any such representation would only misrepresent God and mislead people with regard to him. If God is infinite, the self-existent being, I am, he gives his name in verse 2, I am the Lord thy God, the Lord, the divine name. If he is the self-existent God, never made, never formed, he always was, he needs no energy source, he requires nothing from us at all, he is self-existing entirely. If he is all that, then dear friends, uh, how can we illustrate him? He's infinite, he's everlasting. What artist could ever depict something which is eternal, something which is infinite? It cannot be done. The infinite intelligence, the infinite power of God, any attempt to depict will only pull him down from his heights and insult him and belittle him and diminish him. It is an impossible thing to do. These are positive reasons. Our God is so mighty, almighty, and great, and all-knowing, and all-powerful, that any illustration or representation is an offense. This is the God who announces himself as our God. What a tragedy to be without him. What a tragedy to miss him and his help and his wisdom and his power. So I can't develop the theme, but you see, it is positive fundamentally. It is full of good things. This is a matter of saying to the lost, look what you are missing. Look at our sorry condition. Look at what is available to us and what God will do for us and in us. And yet you have the sad fact of idolatry. And there are so many idols. We're not thinking just of the idols of ancient times, alternatives to God. So many material idols so many idols from pleasure and possessions. Well, we need them. If we do not have the true God, we have got to make substitutes. We've got to have something to give us a reason for living, to give us energy and hope. Why, we've got to have something to lift us and cheer us. And all we've got is material things and trivial things and small things. And we can look at the idols of ancient times though they're still existent in many cultures, and we can sneer at them and deride them, but our idols are no bigger. They're just as lifeless. The things that we depend upon, the things we rely on, and yet we must preach this in the context of all that is lost and all that it's miss, is missed and what God will do. And we can ask questions about idols in people's lives. Kindly questions. Are your idols personal? Are they knowable? Do your idols and your possessions and your ambitions and your pleasures, do they have power to help you? Power in times of real crisis and need? Can your earthly idols explain things to you? The meaning of life, the true God can do all these things and has done all these things. Can they explain the difficult issues of life and why things are as they are? Of course they can't. The idols are so small and so trivial and so petty. Can our idols of pleasure, entertainment and possession, can they purge the conscience? Can they give forgiveness? Are they for all people or are the particular things that we depend upon only for those who have money or substance? They're not available to all. 
like all the abundance of the living God, are they eternal? Will they last? So there is so much scope here to present God and the wonders of having God and worshipping him and admiring him. In fact, idols are described as an abomination to the Lord. And of course they are, because they reject God. They say to God, away with you. We'd rather have these little things. Away with any notion of God. However much we have an instinctual awareness of his being and his eternal power, we don't want him. So any idolatry, any trying to get satisfaction or happiness from things in life other than from God, well, of course we can be happy at many things, but I'm talking about major satisfaction and a reason for living and consolation in great trials and needs. Any effort to do this or secure this apart from the living God obviously is an insult to him and a rejection of him. It is not worthy of us. Here we are, so much higher than the animals, with all the powers that we have, and we're feeding our minds and our hearts on the trivial and the petty and the small and the things that will decay and disappear. It's an insult to God. It's an insult to humanity and to how we are made by him and the measure of human beings. Only God, the true God, is worthy of real love and dependence and affection. Only he is powerful. Only he is faithful and caring and forgiving. And it's always worth explaining to people too that all the idols of ancient times, they had to be placated. They were very much like human beings. They were bad-tempered, capricious. Everything was the matter with them. And people in a superstitious hope of better fortunes had to make sacrifices to them. Yes, well... The true faith had sacrifices too, but they were quite different. The sacrifices were not to appease an angry God. The sacrifices were visual aids of the Messiah who would come and who would do that on our behalf to purge away our sin. And in a sense, we may say to people that in Christianity, we do not sacrifice to God, but God in Christ Jesus came to sacrifice for us to take our sin and make an atonement so that we might be forgiven. But just a few comments on Exodus 3, just a few, uh, 20 rather, just a few ideas to show how you can approach this kind of passage positively, bringing out positive things. And you could do it sympathetically. And it's a matter of presenting what is missed and what is lost and how people are impoverished. Let me hurry on to Deuteronomy chapter 29 and you see the same principle at work. And we may so often find the positive aspect of a passage. Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 4. These astonishing words to the Jews at the time. Yet the Lord hath not given you an heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears to hear unto this day. Now those are words of condemnation. Those are words of reproof. And you might think, well, how can they be applied in a positive manner? But let's think, dear friends, when we do our preparation. We are to preach not only to produce conviction of sin, but to show loving kindness and sympathy for people. We are trying to win them and show them blessing and positive virtues of a walk with God, with Christ. And we must open our eyes to every passage to see what is here which depicts something that people are missing, something they are tragically without, something that they lack, where is my message of sympathy and identification as well as my message of conviction in the passage? It's very important to have this in the grid you place on any scripture passage when you prepare from it. Yet the Lord 
hath not given you an heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears to hear unto this day. Well, it's about being spiritually insensitive. It's an astonishing statement. These friends had been in the wilderness for 38 years. You may say they'd been to church for 38 years and still they didn't have eyes to see and they didn't have any spiritual perception. What can we glean from that which is positive? It's about spiritual deadness. It's about the absence of life in the soul. But don't you see? That can be presented so sympathetically. Oh, friends, we ask, do you have life in your soul? You have a soul. You have spiritual potential. But it doesn't function. We cannot say theologically that it's dead. But it's as good as dead. It doesn't function. It doesn't operate. There is no communion with God. What a difference it would make to have a soul, a spirit that functioned, that was alive. What a blessing to be able to walk with God and perceive him and know him. These are things we burningly desire people to have. 38 years and there was spiritual unconsciousness and spiritual stupor. And oh, if we could deliver people from that. As once somebody put it, the people after nearly 40 years were spiritually brain-dead. It's an unfortunate term, but it was true. No vital function of the soul. No spiritual feelings. No sense of the living God. No desire for him. No taste for him. What a sad, sad situation. What a lack. We don't say that by way of denouncing people. We say that with sympathy. To gain attention, yes, but to show our sympathy for them. We've all been in that position. The sympathy of the preaching of the gospel. Oh, to be sightless. To have no sense whatever of the living God. It's all emptiness and boredom. Any God talk, any spiritual talk. Friends, it's so difficult and yet it's so rewarding to put these things across. No gratitude to God, no sense of his love. What a thing to miss. No sense of destiny, no awe and wonder in the soul. Yet they'd seen the signs, Moses will reason with them. They'd had the manna, they'd had the deliverances, and so have we. We've got the signs too. Ordinary people around us, and they have some sense of eternity and a divine being, some sense of the complexity of the created order. They don't altogether believe that everything came from nothing. Isn't it wonderful even to see the poles on this one for all the material which has bombarded the population of this land for decades now from all the media, people when questioned still feel there is something divine. They don't know what, they're ignorant, but they have a sense of something. What a tragedy to have no understanding, no realization, even though we're preoccupied with material things. What a sad lack. We are half people, but try to get it across sympathetically. There's so much to find, so much to discover. And I'm just really making the point that even a passage like this, which has an unpromising start, and heart to perceive, and eyes to see, and ears to hear, none of these things. Well, friends, we can cast it in a positive way. Let's go on to Psalm 8. I'm a little uh, anxious about this because our brother tomorrow will be talking about the Psalms, but I'm going to steal just one, which I hope won't be on his agenda, 
and it's Psalm 8. And here's another example of this. It is, of course, the testimony of King David. Well, we debate this. Some say the testimony of King David is Psalm 8. Others say the testimony of King David is Psalm 40. I have found a way to solve the problem. Preach both of them as his testimony. As long as you do it wide enough apart, nobody will notice. Well, they both are his testimony, obviously. And it may be that Psalm 40 is speaking of the same event as Psalm 8, but it's putting another side of the matter. And you put Psalm 8 and Psalm 40 together, and they will make, well, it'll be far too long for one sermon. So keep them apart. But it's wonderful to study them together. So David in Psalm 8, look at these words. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Well, if we take it as David's testimony, he speaks as a convert and as a prophet. There is undoubtedly a double sense in this psalm. And I believe that David has, under inspiration, given us a warning that there's a double sense by repeating a verse. Verse 1, O Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. And verse 9, the same sentiment. And that warns us, that tells us that there is something unusual about this psalm. It's his testimony, it is also prophetic. Let's look at the element of the testimony. It's about two visits of God. A visit to David personally. No doubt as a young man. Not, I think, a child, but a young man. Still a shepherd for his father, a wealthy country squire, as you know. Still out on the hills and the plains looking after the sheep. This is his reflection and his testimony. It starts really in verse 3, but we go back to verse 2 in a moment. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? As one writer put it rather beautifully, as the poet gazes out, into the liquid depths of the night sky, there weighs upon him an overwhelming sense of his insignificance. That's how it all began with King David, sitting there at night, looking at the vast expanse of the sky and realizing how small he was and that God was immense and infinite and wonderful. Look back to the very first verse and you'll soon see how you can structure an evangelistic address. O oh Lord, our Lord. You won't see this very often. You notice in your King James Version that the first Lord is in capital letters and the second is not. Two names of God, two ways of describing God. The divine name first, O oh Lord. Or you could translate it, oh, Jehovah. The divine initials in the original, the name of God, the self-existent, infinite God, the source of everything, the source of all life, the source of all power. He's been sitting there at night just looking into the sky and he realizes God is immense beyond any human grasp and wonderful and all-knowing and everything he sees and the night stars all flow from divine power. And then he uses another term for the Lord, our Lord, indicating our ruler, our sovereign God, our controller, our superintendent, he feels under his authority. He feels accountable to him. He speaks both of the immensity of the divine being and then of the authority and the rule of the divine being. 
Well, in using terms like this, he has to be a converted person to grasp the power of God. And he knows he's accountable. Now, these are precious things. For God to bring anybody into that state and condition where they understand his majesty, his infinity, his power, his attributes, and his authority, and their own accountability, that is a wonderful condition to be brought into. And then he proceeds, and he says there in the first verse, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. The Hebrew means immense, but it means more than that. The translators have done all they could do by using the word excellent. It means immense, majestic, all-surpassing, preeminent. It means all those things. How powerful and immense beyond anything else is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens, a God who is worthy to be loved and to be worshipped and to be obeyed. We're now the testimony. Look at verse 2. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies. Don't you see he's talking of himself first? It also will be a prophetic statement, but he's speaking of himself. Let's imagine, let's picture him of being late teenage, 20 or so, something of that kind. But he speaks of himself. I too, even I was a rebellious child, he thinks. Just a babe, a naive thing. I scurried around. I understood nothing of God. I'd never really sensed him or met him or proved him or sought after him. I did things for myself. And out of the mouth of a mere naive babe, a child, God has brought me to realize his immensity and glory and majesty. Don't you see? It's his testimony. He's telling us he's one of those babes. He's one of those naive, simple ones. He's one of those who's been brought from ignorance and darkness to every kind of precious light. It's the words of the one who, gazing into the night sky, had such an impression laid on his heart that he sought the Lord. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies. O oh Lord, I have been saved, David seems to say. I have been brought to repentance and faith, and God has thwarted his enemies and he does it by saving souls and taking them out of Satan's grasp and making them his own and giving them new life. That's the meaning of verse 2. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies that thou mightest still frustrate and quell the enemy and the avenger. Satan and his hosts and those who are his. And then it proceeds. It was all through consideration. Verse 3, when I consider, when I think about thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, the vast expanse, the fixed order of things, at night, when all the frenzy of life dies down, then David could see it, the power and majesty of God, the order of the night sky, when there are not all human distractions to drown it out. And it brought him to repentance, and it brought him to seeking. And he says this, this is a reflection of his thinking, verse 4. What is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man, that thou visitest him, there'll be a dual sense. But he asks, what is man? Why should the mighty God have touched me? 
Why should I have been brought to see his immensity and his majesty and his goodness and his glory and his authority and my accountability to him? Why me? Why does he take an interest in human beings? And I wonder if he thought, ah, I see, I look at the animals, and of course, they do not have the power of reason. God has made us to be special and to be his own. They do not have a moral consciousness, a conscience. They are altogether different from human beings. They do not have creativity. They do not have the gift of language. They do not have a sense of eternity. They do not have any spiritual intuition. What is man? I never realized it, he seems to say. The special place and condition of man. And I've lived like a creature, a beast, an animal, in disregard of God. And yet I've been made with these facilities and these possibilities. What is man? Indeed, what is man? A sinner, a God-rejecter, a God-neglecter, and yet God is still saving lost men. And Christ, the eternal Son of God, has come to suffer and to die in great kindness and unimaginable sympathy in saving love for lost people to secure forgiveness. You see, the positive can come out of this, as well as the negative. We must think, dear friends, or people will only be frightened off when there are such wonderful things in the word of God. There is the look what you are missing reasoning. Look who you are. Look at God's kindness towards the human race. Look at the purpose of life. Look at your special constitution. There's so much reasoning in the scripture. And depravity and sin, obviously, is a vital part of it. But there are other things also. Then I could take you down in Psalm 8 to verse 4. Well, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Why do you deal with him? Why do you visit him? He doesn't deserve anything. There's nothing desirable to God in him because he's a rebel. And verse 5 continues the sense of amazement. For thou hast made him, speaking at this juncture about man, not of Christ, that's the prophetic aspect. We'll come to it. For thou hast made him ordinary mortal man, a little lower than the angels, what gifts, what powers. He's not just an animal after all. He's only a little lower than the angels and has crowned him with glory and honor by salvation, by visiting him. And look at verse 6, though it's expressed in agrarian terms, the language of the shepherd and the farmer, yet it refers to spiritual and eternal things. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, and so on. Why man? He'll find the Lord. He'll know spiritual blessings through Christ, or he can do so. And one day he'll go to heaven, and he'll be lifted up above the world of animals. And ultimately, he'll be in the heavenly earth. The earth combined with heaven. When earth, the new heavens and the new earth are formed. And earth is, as it were, lifted up to heaven. And heaven comes down to earth. Those are things which even David could see in the years ahead. And that's what he speaks of that is possible for man to be saved and to have all spiritual blessings. But yes, there's prophecy in the Psalm too. There's the second visit of the Messiah, but I'm not going to go into that just now. Let me take you to Isaiah chapter 38, just for another theme, 
and then we'll come to conclusion for this first address. Isaiah chapter 38, verse 1. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death, and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Now this is a little more negative than the previous passage we considered. Hezekiah, sole king of Judah from uh, 715 BC, 14 years before this had done a very foolish thing and listened to his godless princes to try to throw off the yoke of Assyria and desire a confederation with Egypt. Well, we won't go into those kind of details necessarily in evangelistic preaching. But now the disfavor of God comes and his life is going to be cut short. He's a godly man. He's not going to hell, but his life is going to be cut short. But what a verse it is for us to make use of. Thus saith the Lord, set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. I'm sure many of you have made use of this verse. Set thine house in order. Death is spoken of, and death awaits, obviously, every one of us. If you're going to die soon, unless you've already done it, there are things to be done. You have to make a will. Maybe, maybe you'll feel you need to apologize to certain people. You need to straighten out your affairs in that sense. Maybe there are wrongs to be righted. Maybe in your house you've got all kinds of things you've ac accumulated. You can't leave them there. You've got to sort those things out. Get rid of the rubbish. You don't want to impose it all on someone else to have that sad duty. There are matters to be resolved, people to be provided for, things that only you can do. And now they're urgent because death is imminent and you have had some kind of a warning. But the main illustration comes here from the word house. Set thine house in order. You could interpret it in a very rationalistic manner. By house, this simply refers to the household in terms of the descendants of Hezekiah. He had a small boy. He wasn't ready to be king. Somebody else would have to be appointed. There were certain things to sort out like that. But oh no, it goes beyond that. Set thine house in order. It's a conscious illustration. Sort out the house of your life. The house of your life is your body and your brain and your actions. You have it on lease from God. The lease is being called in. You've had the warning. You're going to vacate the house and it's going to be inspected. You had a, ever had a holiday let with a particularly officious landlord who's gone over everything the day you left? Well, God isn't officious, but it's the greatest inspection imaginable when you vacate the house of your life. Your character, your soul, these are rooms in the house of your life. What state are they in when they're examined? Are they dirty? Are the windows of your house obscured so that there's no light in the soul? Is the interior dark and there's no sunshine and no happiness within? Now you see, it can begin to get really sympathetic because this is challenging. But oh, what are people missing with no spiritual blessing, facing a day of account when things could be so different? There's an inherent sympathy. Is there a kind of damp rot in the house of your life? Unpainted things, unsightly doors off, every temptation roams in and out of the house at will. Are there smells? in the house, smells of guilt, 
Are you a profane person such as Esau in the letter to the Hebrews? Profane, the word strangely meaning a threshold walker. In other words, are you a house with no holy of holies and no reserve and every worldly idea comes in and takes you over? You're just free passage to anything to tramp through. Set your house in order. Realize you're accountable to God. Oh, it could be so much better. And there are the opportunities. Look at the departments of the house, the house of the soul. There's your mind, and you can explore these. I mustn't spend time. Is your mind out of order? It's all for me. You've got a mind that plans to sin. It has no time for God. It's a factory for lies and excuses. Your mind, what a tragedy. Or for self-pity, or for covetous dreams. No room for gratitude to God and service and love for him. Is your heart another department of your soul, the house of your life? Is your heart out of order? Your tastes, your emotions, your feelings are all for earthly things and maybe low things and even dirty things, sensual things, coarse things. What a tragedy. And tempers and tantrums and even cruelty and heartlessness. Is the will out of order, the executive part of your life? Does it override the conscience and crush it and silence it? What a terrible tragedy for the house to be out of order, unable to face death. And what are the financial affairs of the soul of your life? Do you owe God homage, appreciation, love, study, service? This is the way to put across the need of the soul. Is this your house, set thine house in order, for thou shalt die. Oh, there's no Calvary in this part of Isaiah 38. Well, then write it in. That's the gospel preacher's task. There's no Calvary there, but you must put it there. You must bring this message to Calvary and repentance and conversion and life. Oh, dear friends, I hope I'm stimulating. What I'm saying maybe will not be new to many of you, and you already practice these things, but oh, just to stimulate some friends that you can preach the gospel without being wholly negative.